afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. We're going to be talking about five key elements of narcissistic psychopathy. One of the first things that I want to cover, number one, is when we refer to narcissistic personality disorder, we need to bear in mind that it's very rarely diagnosed on its own. It's typically diagnosed comorbid with other mental health issues and other personality disorders. When we're talking about psychopathy, in a sense, we're talking about the root of all the cluster B personality disorders, because this cluster B personality disorder that I've been using for 12 years, <laughs> well, it's 12 years gone, for 12 years now from the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and the American Psychiatric Association, um, obviously it's flawed. Every model is flawed. Every model is, and psychology only operates from models. Um, one of the big problems is you can only define it by being outside of it and seeing oh, there's an observer effect. It's like quantum physics. It's, it's the observer effect. You're observing nasty behavior. You're observing antisocial behavior. But when psychiatrists say antisocial, they don't mean schizoid. They don't mean somebody who's isolating themselves from other people. What they mean is, is that instead of being able to socialize harmoniously with a good degree of uh, cooperation and agreeability, the person is antisocial. They're, they disrupt communities. They hurt communities. They hurt other people. So when you go through and you look and you go, oh, uh, plus to be personality disorders, antisocial personality disorder. Um, histrionic, BPD, NPD, these are called the dramatic cluster of disorders. It's dram and it's they're all mainly defined, not, not exclusively defined by what we see, by what the clinician sees, by what the therapist sees. They're not describing particularly what the individual subjective experience is because it's almost inaccessible. We can't get to it. So in a sense, if you go back historically through psychology, you could say all of these are manifestations of psychopathy. So a, a, a psychopath way back, I think, I think the history of psychopathy, that its use goes back to the 1880s, you would really be, it was kind of like saying, to use the uh, ep episteme, the way of knowing the world of that time, a moral degenerate. This person is a moral degenerate. They're not agreeable. They're, they won't cooperate. They won't um, honor the social contract. They won't commit to social norms. And so, you know, if you're of a rebellious mindset and you meet somebody who's quite rebellious, it's quite cute and sexy and risky and exciting and dangerous and everything. And some, some people can be rebellious and be moral, but the dividing line is morality. The dividing line is morality. The psychologists will say, no, it's empathy. But that's because they're trying to be scientists. And so they're saying, what can I observe? What can I see? If you go upstream of that into philosophy, it's better for you. It's better for me. You want to know if the person has a functioning moral core or not. And if they are, I'm suggesting. And other people suggest it as well. This isn't that fringe this is not so weird but it's not the orthodoxy the supra um term for all of these things is really their manifestations of psychopathy the the human being no longer functions in a cooperative way inside of tribes uh, groups they can't adhere to group norms they won't adhere to group norms in fact we observe them getting pleasure from tearing group norms up and making a fuss and making life difficult for other human beings. So when you say, this is, we're still on point one, sorry. <laughs> when you say narcissistic psychopathy, remember that it's the psychopathy that's the most important thing. It's the psychopathy that's the most important thing. Histrionic, borderline, ASPD, narcissism, uh, dark triad, dark tetrad, these are nasty people. These are painful to be around. They're, they're exhausting to be around. What is it um, some clinicians say of people with uh, uh, borderline personality disorder? Uh, um, 
clinicians will complain of compassion fatigue so originally you feel sorry and you work for the, with the client and then slowly over time you 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 experience compassion fatigue now before you get all hashtag triggered over me saying that about borderline personality disorder number one it is in the cluster b personality disorder spectrum that ain't my fault i didn't do it i didn't do it. the american psychiatric association did it get mad at them number two if you got diagnosed with bpd i would want to know who diagnosed you was it a counselor or was it a qualified clinician? Did they diagnose you or did they express an informed opinion? Did they test you officially for BPD? Were you given a clinical setting test for BPD? Why am I raising this issue? Because I suspect I'm not alone in this either. This is not a fringe, weird conspiracy YouTube dude idea that BPD is massively misdiagnosed. In fact, there is published research that suggests BPD is misdiagnosed as much as 40% of the time. I didn't say 14. I said 40, 40. Ladies and gents, in its effort to model medicine, psychology has failed. If you want to know more about that subject, say in the comments, we can talk about another day. Uh, or you could just Google psychology replication crisis because over 50% of published uh, psychology papers were not replicable they're not replicable which means it's junk as far as science goes the bpd diagnosis i personally don't feel is valid we're going to come back to narcissistic psychopathy let me cover this real quick because people who've got the bpd diagnosis and then they put bpd in their bio i'm a taurus i'm bpd i'm an empath swirly star unicorn and then a quote from the bible you might not have bpd bpd may not exist at all Again, that's not just me saying it. Many people say it. So Judith Herman, uh, who was the, she's a professor at Harvard University. She was, maybe she still is the head of the psychology department at Harvard University. She's not for the BPD diagnosis. She, she like me, believes it's an outmoded uh, uh, diagnosis and that it actually splits. It splits down the middle. So when you get people misdiagnosed with BPD, Remember, it's 40% misdiagnosed. If there was a virus out there and doctors were misdiagnosing that virus and it had a 40% misdiagnosis rate, what do you think would happen in the field of medicine? There's only two things that are going to happen. They're either going to say that virus doesn't exist or your diagnostic tools are dog poop. I'll try not to swear in the first 20 minutes of the video because it helps with my YouTube rankings if I say all swearing to the end. Impulse control, self-discipline. So if you've got the BPD diagnosis, you might not have it. It splits. It's people with CPTSD and the clinician just isn't CPTSD informed, which is which is okay. That's not I'm not being a dick about it. It's not a criticism. Like you learn what you learn when you went through your school, when you went through your university or wherever you got the qualification from. And that wasn't covered. And it's coming into the orthodoxy of psychology, but not quite fully there yet. And the other side of BPD is just vulnerable narcissism. Or you could say um, maybe a, a, a kind of fragile, vulnerable, also called covert narcissism with a high degree of PTSD, which leads to very high levels of emotional dysregulation. The second thing to understand about, so the first thing to understand about narcissistic psychopathy is psychopathy is the most important thing. It's the it's the super definition above all the other definitions, okay? What I want you to, so that's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is this, um, this is a moral issue. And this has created a blind spot in psychology, a blind spot in therapists and psychiatrists, because if we're trying to be scientific, remember psychiatrists are full doctors. They're, 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 they're MDs. You're an MD first, and then you're trained in psychiatry. Psychologists, psychotherapists will use published research, but I just said it's not good. It's just not good work. Like if, if I was a school teacher and I was in a sec I used to work in secondary schools and a bunch of 16 year olds handed in that work and none of it or oh, sorry, more than half of it was not replicable. I'd be like, you're getting F's. <laughs> you failed. Like it's that's not science. If it's not replicable, it's if you can't replicate the experiment and replicate the results. It's junk it's bordering on charlatanism I'm, I'm only telling you that to give you the context 
to help you understand. I know you're not trying to get a PhD. I know you're not trying to become a psychotherapist or most, most of you aren't. You just want to understand, but you get information from qualified psychotherapists and psychiatrists, which contradicts each other. Then you go online and you read the literature because you're capable of using Google Scholar. You're capable of opening a Wikipedia article and then reading the references. I know that. You can at least read the abstracts. And you're like, this, this, and this doesn't make sense with this. If you want me to do it, I can give you a, crit a critique of the DSM entry on all across the B. Well, just focus on MPD. From one page to the next, the DSM-5 contradicts itself in its definitions of MPD. Let's leave that aside. They can't tell you it's a moral issue. It's not allowed. It's verboten. It's a, it's, it, it, uh, there's no morality in science. There's no morality in, in medicine. I was watching a show uh, the other day. It's set in uh, Holland, and then people are being rounded up because the Allies are coming and the Nazis are running away. And they take this Dutch doctor, and they're like, you have to run and hide. And he's like, why? I said, well, because you treated, you treated Nazi soldiers. He said, I'm a doctor. What, what do you want? It's a broken body. What do you want me to do? I'm not like that's. I'm trained to heal broken bodies. So it's 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 amoral. It's not immoral. It's amoral. So they don't want to have a moral debate. But you and I, as just normal people who just don't want to be in narcissistic, psychopathic relationships, we don't want to be at the at the, at the hands of these people. We will develop predator blindness if we remain subsumed in this ideology. Yes, psychotherapy is an ideology. I make no apologies for that. It's irrefutable. Psychiatry is, is ideologically infected. Psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, counseling, apologies to my psychotherapeutic friends, to my counseling friends. It absolutely is ideologically infected. This is irrefutable. We can argue about it um, elsewhere, not here, uh, not today. It takes too long. Um, it is ideologically infected. You must have the power to see evil as evil. You must have the power to see immorality as immorality. Because, because look, 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 look what psychology, I got a bit excited then. I gave six L's on the word look. Look, 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 look at what psychology has given you. Look at what psychologization has given you. You are uh, beaten by a mugger who steals your watch and he breaks your cheekbone while still in your watch. If you're subsumed in the ideology of psychology, you'll say, I would say, God, what a, what a, what a POS. I hope they slam him in jail. I hope he goes to prison. But you, trauma-informed, trauma, you have to say trauma-informed like this, trauma-informed. I'm tra trauma-informed. You have to say, oh, yes, he's a criminal. But it is it not the culture and the society that forced him to take his fist and smash me in the face and steal my Rolex. That's pure ideology. And it is also, I wish I could swear, 20 minutes. Hold on. An effing lie. That is a lie. It's a horrendous lie. A monstrous lie that hurts you him and the whole of society oh he has no choice well his brother's not doing that his sister's not doing that the guy who was raised in the house opposite him who's raised in the same conditions uh, is running a car washing service he doesn't punch middle-aged women in the face and fracture their cheekbones for a watch why are we suggesting that he's oh but the his childhood his trauma his we all have childhood trauma and pain my god you, you don't let them declaw you. Don't let them defang you. It's not good. It only benefits narcissistic psychopaths at the high end of culture, at the top end, at the top of the pyramid, for you to believe that there's no such thing as evil. Everybody is a friend that you just haven't met yet. No, no, no. Some people are really bad. They gave their souls away. They're really evil. And you should be able to look and say that is evil how can we do that if you can't broach the moral subject the person is immoral done finished as they say in arabic khalas khalas finished no more that is an immoral person how do we know 
He did this. He did this. He gloated and said he did it. He's bragged multiple times. He's written essays bragging about how wonderful it is to hurt people. That guy's a POS. But is it narcissistic psychopathy with two squirts of BPD and a touch of histrionic? Is he vulnerable? Is he grandiose? The ring the hands. Ring your hands with your elbows up. Oh, ringy, ringy, ring. Doesn't matter. Not important. Not important. I said this about, there was this thing that came out a couple of years ago and everybody's talking about Ted Bundy. And I was like, don't talk about him. Forget him. He is a, a moron. He's an idiot. These are not interesting people. There's nothing to, oh, why did, oh, why did Ted do it? A law student, a pretty law student with brown hair parted, a pretty white law student with brown hair parted in the middle, rejected him. And he couldn't get through law school, not because he wasn't smart enough, because he didn't have the impulse control. She rejected him. So he beat women, uh, girls. I mean, well, they're women, but they're like 19, 20, 21 year olds, young women to death. Oh, but why? And is he a narcissist? Kill him, burn his memory, and unperson him. That's what a civilized society should do. Not agonize and wring our hands over. Why do people? But but why? But why? I I do not care. We get 75 years here each. That's it. 75 trips around the sun. You're only capable from the age of 25 to 65. You're only capable and physically fit at your, you know, 40 years. I'm not agonizing over people who act. Nor should you. Don't let the psychology loon balls or people who are lunatics who, who are misusing psychology terms fool you evil is evil the end it's not the responsibility of a victim of a violent crime a metaphorical crime a financial crime an emotional crime to analyze their predator that's so sick that's disgusting yes he beat me he tortured me he pulled out my fingernails but you know his mom no no you don't have to do that that's why I say psychotherapy and psychology is ideologically infected and it's irrefutable. The issue is a moral one. Don't let them fool you. Does that person have a functioning moral core? Yes or no? If no, finished. It's not complicated. They want to make it complicated because if it's complicated, they maintain their status. They maintain you in a state of confusion. They can exchange highfalutin uh, complicated sounding jargon with each other and communicate in some higher level gobbledygook psychobabble that ex is exclusionary and makes you think, oh my goodness, they must be really clever. These are extremely difficult sounding words. They're real swats. No, they're, it's charlatanism. It's charlatanism. Evil is evil. It's as simple as that. The third thing that you need to understand with narcissistic psychopathy is you have an evil because it be, okay so it's it's amoral in that the moral system is broken it's they don't have a functioning moral core now we have a marriage made in hell between an extreme form of grandiose delusional disassociative self-worship and pure robotic dumb not clever like a, it's not Psychopathy is not complex. A, 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 a narcissist, yes, the clockwork of narcissism is complicated. Psychopathy is not complicated. It's like, what would you be? What would um, uh, the human animal be if nobody was wringing their hands over issues of morality? Is it really? No, it can't be that. No, Richard, <laughs> I don't listen here, old boy. I don't think you understand psychopathy. No, I understand it perfectly well. The history and the conception of psychopathy comes from one place in the world, the American penal system. It is large, modern psychopathy, not the way old English physicians in the 1880s running asylums where they would take the inmates and put them inside a giant washing machines or boil them or dunk them in ice baths to torture the hysteria out of them. No, 
The modern conception of psychopathy is the weight of research comes from the American penal system. Do you think the average American prisoner is Hannibal Lecter? Sorry if you do, you've been watching too much TV. I work for the probation service. The average criminal is not some high functioning, bark loving, uh, you know, lover of the orchestra and haute cuisine and ancient Italian literature, I'm afraid. They are people who've been raised in such horrifying environments that a lot of their uh, uh, prefrontal cortex located humanity has just been burned away. Just, it just never got the opportunity to develop. They're now adults. Could it develop? I don't know. It's not my problem. Maybe. It, like, I, I'm not the savior of humanity. I'm just a guy. Like I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe some really smart people will come up. But that is what it is. It's not complicated. Ted Bundy is not fascinating. He's a boring, moronic, brutal, horrible, evil machine of a human being like all other career criminals are. I have to be somewhat careful because I have to walk the streets of Liverpool again. I don't interview career criminals, you will notice, um, when I do Richard Grannon and Friends. I have access to them and I get tons of views for it, but I don't like celebrating it. I think it's stupid. I think being a bum who can't contribute properly to society, who's beloved by stupid, ratchet, wretched teenagers for being a gangster is about as dumb as it gets. It's about as dumb as it gets. It's, it's moral degeneracy writ large. These are mo So I would use the 1880s terminology unironically here. You're, you're a moral degenerate. No, but I'm the hardest man in, in the town and everybody's scared of me. Everybody's scared of you because you're a lunatic who turns up at people's houses at six in the morning and stabs them on the doorstep. Yes, that's frightening. And it's a sort of power, but it's the kind of power that we mainly worked out of our systems by 1680. You're a couple of centuries out of date, mate. It's not real power. It's like a fake sort of a power. So... I want you to understand that there's this evil marriage of something. Yes, the, the clockwork of narcissism is, is complex. The clockwork of psychopathy is not. Don't let them befuddle you. But they're married together. So you have delusional, grandiose, extremely vain, extremely preoccupied with, with uh, self-image, uh, preoccupation with worship of the self, with this dumb, terminator, objective-orientated, do-whatever-it-takes maniac. That's the narcissistic psychopathy, and that is a dangerous mix. That should be taken very, very seriously. The fourth thing I would like you to understand is that when people are saying right now we're, an ep we're in an, uh, an epidemic of narcissism, we are not. We are not. This is an epidemic of narcissistic psychopathy. These people are not simply delusional. They're not just grandiose. They're not just dissociated. They're not just a, a living a sort of a psychotic wank fantasy in which they're wonderful and everybody else is a slave to them. It's mixed with single mindedness. Now, so, the, so the, the fourth point I wanted to raise with you, you as a normal, I presume, <laughs> Who knows? There's probably serial killers watching this for I know. <laughs> but the majority of you, somewhere on a spectrum of normality, let us say, when you say, I want something, I don't believe that you actually have done the thought experiment philosophically to have true empathy for wanting something the way a narcissistic psychopath does. The only time I've ever seen this put to film, and it was quite funny, was the scenes with American Psycho, where Christian Bale, who beat me up as a child on a squash court in Portugal in Villamora, and I'm going to have him for that one day. I got beaten up by Batman. Not badly. He just gave me a dead leg. He's a nice kid. He was a nice kid. We just fought all the time whenever we saw each other. He plays Patrick Bateman. And uh, they bring out the, you know where I'm going with this, the business cards. The business cards. And he's so, his internal monologue, his superego injunctions are going through the roof because other people have more beautiful business cards than he does. And it's so well acted. He sees like somebody brings out, one guy brings out a nicer business card and then a, another nicer one. And then the final boss of business cards is brought out. And Christian Bale as, as Patrick Bateman just looks 
and gulps. He just swallows and he's absolute that's just devastated, mortified. How could somebody be so attached to a business card? That's the narcissistic psychopath. Where their love, their care, their attachment, their fulfillment, their joie de vivre should come from humans, it comes from things. They use humans and they love things where they should be using things and loving humans. So it's an inversion. Psychopathy, uh, more than narcissism, is usually also defined by multiple inversions. Good is inverted to evil. And they like to um, they like to subvert. So if they see you with a morality, it would give a narcissistic psychopath a lot of pleasure to invert your morality and make you do the opposite of what you believe to be good and true. Uh, simply to gratify their own sense that they have the power to be able to do that. I must leave you for one second. Don't go into um, abandonment anxiety. I will be 15 seconds. The fifth and final thing uh, that I would like everybody to be aware of and to simply awaken to um, when you feel like you have the courage to open your eyes, see evil as evil. Why would that take courage? Why would it take courage? Because if you do that, the shit and stuff in your life and people that you're going to have to give up on, it's tough. If I see evil as evil, judge it as evil judge it oh no i mustn't judge anything yes yes you're an adult it's not just your right it's your duty who's going to protect the children who's going to protect the children if the adults don't yes evil is evil yes evil is evil see it as evil when you see it as evil you must then act accordingly that means you reject it you rebuke it you judge it you condemn it not oh no. well i don't think we should be doing that to the children <laughs> no you should say loudly and proudly with courage no you're not doing that it's evil it's wrong it's perversion this is degeneracy you are moral degenerates go away stop i won't let you do this and remember a boundary is not really a boundary if there's no consequence to somebody transgressing it there must be consequences to people transgressing boundaries. Well, that's not a boundary. That's some, I don't even know what that is. It's like a little uh, philosophical affectation. You know, this is what I think the world should be. No, judge evil is evil and act accordingly when you see it. And if that means you need to cut people and things out of your life, then cut them out. It takes courage. The last thing I want to leave you with if you have the courage to see it and your eyes are open to it, it is everywhere. It's in everything. Everything. Because the people who craft this world, the people who are the artisans, the engineers, the makers, the craftsmen, the craftswomen, the, the makers of this world are narcissistic psychopaths because it's narcissistic psychopaths who choose to believe that they're the ones who deserve to be in control it is not narcissism that is your enemy it is narcissistic psychopathy and it is everywhere 28 minutes save the swearing to the end didn't get a forehead sweat on quite proud of myself let's do some questions please make it one question one sentence long and end in a question mark. Try to hold back on talking to each other because I got a load of complaints last time. You're not answering my questions. I'm one guy and I see the same chat box that you do. I set it to 60 seconds today. So people can only talk, to, they put a thing and they have to wait 60 seconds before they can speak again. Please use the time wisely. I have five minutes left and then I must leave. So make it one sentence long, have it end in a question mark and away we shall go. Hmm. UG Rose is here. Everybody, UG Rose is here in the chat protecting you. There is an adult on scene protecting us. 
Thank you, Yuji, for helping out. Oxytocin says, awesome live. Thank you. Is Munchausen's by proxy part of narcissistic psychopathy? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Somebody could be engaging in Munchausen's by proxy and not be a narcissistic psychopath, but I imagine they would have to have some significant part of a personality disorder that fell somewhere in the cluster B spectrum, I would think, because you're instrumentalizing your children in a way that is, well, there's no way you can claim that's not damaging. You care more about the attention than you do about the health of your children. So there's definitely a degree of entitlement and exploitation there. So if it's not narcissism, not psychopathy, it's got to be somewhere, I would think, in the, in the cluster B spectrum. His insane ward says, damn. Noel says, thank you, Richard. Have a great evening. You're very welcome. What should I do with a mother-in-law who I must live with on the verge of a narcissistic collapse? I have no idea. I don't know what the, I don't know what your options are. So there are practical questions here. What financial situation are you in that you're, that you must live with her? Can you improve your financial situation? It would be better if you didn't have to live with her, but I don't know. I don't know what power you have and this is a question that really depends on the power you have in the situation to take action ted is here and he says richard if you have a milkshake and i have a milkshake do you see it there it is and i have a straw and my straw reaches across the room and starts to drink your milkshake i drink your milkshake i drink it up <laughs> And if you haven't seen There Will Be Blood, that would have been weird. Eli, boy, sniveling boy. So that's a really good representation of a narcissistic psychopath. Um, if you've not seen There Will Be Blood, it's a weird movie. It's strangely paced, but, it, but let, it, let it infuse you. And you will see that it's, it, it's, like, it's like a piece of poetry some dark piece of medieval poetry that unfolds in front of you. As you see this, uh, is Daniel Clearview or Plainview, a monster, a monster of a man who we see in the beginning of the film, I won't ruin anything, comes out from the earth. He is literally drinking, not literally drinking. He is metaphorically, uh, uh, vampirically taking the blood of the earth and there's this issue that's called there will be blood there's this imagery around blood and oil and then finally milkshake when he describes to somebody who because there's a narcissistic injury that's been inflicted he's responding with narcissistic rage years after the original narcissistic injury is inflicted upon him daniel blameview it's played by daniel day lewis i can't remember the guy who plays both brothers paul dano beautiful looking film amazing performances if you're interested in narcissistic psychopathy i highly recommend there will be blood and then you will understand what just happened between me and ted as two lovers of there will be blood and my straw reaches across the room there it is, Eli. Do you see it? Uh, Todd, how to heal from narcissistic parents at 50 years old. <laughs> Your age matters not, Todd. I'm four years behind you. <laughs> we must all go where we must. Um, you know, you've, you've got to do the work that somebody at 20 years old would have to do or somebody at 80 years old would have to do. Uh, don't, uh, don't, don't skip therapy day don't skip leg day don't skip therapy day show up to therapy speak to a therapist who understands narcissistic abuse and uh get it fixed person richard if we suspect that someone might be this but they act nice how can we be confident and sure please thank you because you are looking forget all of the youtube videos forget this youtube video forget everything forget everything is there a functioning moral core? Yes or no? Keep it simple. Do you see evil? Yes or no? That's it. That's it. How to rien? Rien. How to rien? Rien? Rien. I don't know. That like this. Rien. I can't speak French. 
meaning I understand French and I can read French and I can write French, but I can't speak it. I can't make the word, the sounds come out. Thank you for helping me through so much. Blessings to you. Thank you, Andrea. As an avoidant with empathy, how can I adjust my behavior to be less toxic? I don't know. I'm not the man to help you with that. Sorry. I have a fairly narrow range of, range of, of skills. I'm only useful uh, for some things. Uh, one question long with one sentence mark would be wonderful. Thank you. Dang, Richard, you're awesome. I agree. I tell myself every morning whilst brushing my teeth. Are they going to remove BPD from the cluster B? Would that help? I don't know what they're going to do. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's, it's going to get a shake up. That's for sure. But whether they take BPD away, I don't know. Um, and the reasons, well, there's political reasons, there's economic reasons. I mean, I'm sure you, well, you're all intelligent people. You can figure out why. If you if you suddenly said tomorrow, ah, oh, yeah, sorry, guys, there's no BPD, <laughs> there would be, there would be trouble. There would be real trouble. So uh, I don't think they can afford to do that, but they're going to change probably the whole framing of the cluster B. Um spectrum in the dsm why do narcissists project but react when you fulfill that projection well because they wanted that reaction wonderful question you've asked um you've asked a question naively good good you've you've asked a naive question um so the narcissist and the narcissistic psychopath is fundamentally a reaction seeking machine and if you such a great question so everybody here will be the more you the more you insist on trying to think of an interaction with them as an adult to adult sincere communication the more frustrated and bewildered you're going to be when you finally accept that that's not a person in the in a traditional sense um but it kind of functions like something from a, a sci-fi horror movie that is as i've described before uh like like a swarm of nanobots that will show up as whatever it needs to show up as in order to get your reaction so you've so that's what they are a swarm of nanobots it'll show up as if it needs you to experience lust it shows up as as, as a sexy entity fear fearful entity happiness funny entity so on and so forth so you've done the timeline the normal way and you've gone, um, you said something that made me have this reaction. And now you're having a, a weird reaction to my reaction, but you created it. But the as I said, narcissist, uh, narcissistic psychopaths in particular, the way to understand a lot of behavior is by inverting it. You, so you invert it. Your reaction was the, sorry, their reaction to your reaction was the point. So the end goal that they had was their reaction. They needed your reaction to get there. So they had to craft the communication very carefully based on their understanding of you to get that reaction so they could say and do the horrible thing that they said and did. It's, it's, it's goal orientated behavior, it's highly manipulative. There's no moral core. And wh wherever we end up, I don't want to make you too paranoid. Think of this as philosophically. Think of this as being like a thought experiment that can sometimes help and sometimes maybe not. Ask yourself the question, is it true in this case to wonder if wherever we've ended up is where he or she wanted us to end up? So if you have like a terrible holiday and it's just a nightmare and there's screaming and crying and you lose money and blah, and you think, who would want this? Like I, they couldn't possibly have wanted this check again check again probably where you're ending up the arguments you're having you're having at the pace the consistency the frequency the volume that they want you to because if you're a good person and you're thinking naively and i don't mean that to be condescending or patronizing i mean it um you're 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 trying to like a good decent adult human being you're trying to be reasonable and you're trying to make horizontal communication darling i am here you seem upset tell me what is wrong and together we will fix it that's your fantasy 
And what is actually happening is you come to them and you try to do equal and they're like, no, this, this is equal. I'm on top. You're beneath me. I'm in charge. You obey. I'm the master. You're the slave. This is equal. This is a perversion. This is an insult. How dare you insult the correct dynamic? A little bit of Madonna there. Fog. Now, don't you do it. No, don't copy me. Uh, Uji Rose says, Oi! Your videos have helped me. Thank you. Thank you. Have you, uh, Chris says, have you ever seen any genuine reversal change in someone you would say has NPD? No. No, I don't believe that NPD can change. Um, but that's my dogma. That's my rigidity. Perhaps it's my immaturity or my lack of experience. I'm just one dude with my experience and my point of view. Um, I think the point in a certain sense of NPD is a protection against reality, is a protection against truth, and is a protection against change. They don't change their their attitudes, their beliefs, their so for some of them, like style, like doesn't change. Nothing changes, and they s can often seem to really fear um, actual change because probably on some level, maybe they're jealous that like people who don't have it can change. We can change. We can grow. You, you, Chris, uh, can have an experience, an argument with somebody, and. Um, maybe you make a mistake or you go too far or you say something that at that moment you believed and then you have the painful uh ego um dystonic experience of going oh i did that wrong i said it wrong that doesn't match my self-image and i'm a believer in telling the truth and i though i believe that to be true at the time i don't think it's true anymore and then through that uncomfortable negative feedback from reality you change and maybe mature and grow and become more careful with your words and uh become a bit more self-restrained and have a bit more um impulse control and, and so on um but they can't do that that's that's not a possibility for them and i i suspect they're jealous of that i suspect there's something archontic about them um i'm not saying gnosticism is real but like vampirism is a myth I sometimes wonder if Gnosticism was an effort to describe, you know, because Gnostics, early Jewish, uh, early rebel Jews, the early rebel Jews were Christian sect was the, the the Christ sect for Jews was weird. If you were a Jew and you joined the Christ sect, they'll be like, oh, all right, mate. And a lot of the first sects were largely Gnostic. And they had this idea of archons, the lords, the lords of the earth um but maybe as as uh jews in a lower economic lower power status position that was a as an unconscious reaction to the to the wealth and the opulence of the roman emperors who they had to try and live alongside and and live under the rule of and to them they seemed um rigid and stiff and hollow and two-dimensional and superficial as all narcissistic psychopaths do. So then they started to say things like the archons, uh, the, which, which just means lords, it's just the lords, uh, need humans because humans are, have spirit in them. We are fallible and weaker than archons, but we have a spirit within us that they don't have and they're jealous of. We have a part of the true divine monad within us, which gives us a creative spark, inspiration. So they can't create, they can replicate almost perfectly. Some of them like brilliantly, they can copy perfectly, but we, the fallible ones, the broken ones, the, the weak ones, humans, real humans, we can create and they can't do that. We can change. They can't do that. We can grow. And maybe, you know, that metaphor, uh, so, so their fear would be, that um, the archon the archontic fear would be that the vulnerable human being would achieve gnosis knowledge nous and then escape 
uh, the reality spiritually. So maybe psychologically, philosophically, you could say, well, maybe that was a way of understanding at the time that there was a potential mode of escape from being under tyrannical rule through having a, a true insightful understanding of the power dynamic that you were at the mercy of. I'm making unconscious suggestions to you now. The revolution starts here, brothers and sisters. Sounds like AI. Sounds like AI. Exactly. Exactly like AI. AI. I'm really worried about AI. I never was. Slavoj Žižek, five years ago, oh, the coming problems with AI, microchips, and so on. I was thinking, AI, is he really worried about AI? And then one of my editors is from Russia, Max. He made uh, a I like Russian hard bass. And as a joke, he asked an AI to make a soundtrack in the Russian hard bass style uh, about me and about my YouTube channel. And it did it. And it's not great, but it's not awful. And I was like, wow, how long did it take to do this? He was like, oh, a couple of minutes. What are we going to need people for? We won't even need people anymore soon enough. Um, Narcissus formed in early childhood. How do you deal with elderly narcissistic father who is 73? The same way you would deal with, with any other narcissist, any other narcissist. You want to try and diminish contact as much as you possibly can. I have to leave. Time is short for all of us. Don't waste your time. See evil as evil and call it out and act accordingly. If you didn't watch the beginning of this, please do. It will be uploaded properly in 20 minutes time ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for your time and your attention these are the most precious resources you have spend them wisely i look forward to speaking to you all again very soon thank you